before I begin this morning, I want to um, share about a, a very exciting kind of thing that we're all going to participate in in a few weeks. And you may have seen this on Facebook. Um, Craig did a Facebook Live video this week. And um, this is about a gift exchange that we are going to do as a church family. And so we're, we're in this series on the gift exchange. And coming up, I believe it's on December the 22nd, that is the Sunday of that Christmas week, we are going to do a family, a church family gift exchange. So as you can see, first, there's just some steps that we want you to follow in this. Um, because we don't want any pressure on any of us for this. We want it to be spirit-led. So first we want you to ask the Father, what is it that I should bring to this? Okay, here's the deal. There's no rules on this, okay? There, if you pray and God says, I want you to bring a big bag of peanut M&Ms, that could be for me. I love peanut M&Ms. For real, though. Um, if, if you pray and God says, I want you to bring a $500 visa card. Someone might need that. <laughs> that could be for me too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we, there's, no, there's nothing too little and there's nothing too great. Everyone can participate in this. You are not excluded based on maybe, oh, you're like, oh, I don't know, it's a stressful time of year. Just pray and ask the Father what is it I should bring? And he will be faithful to put that in your hand to be able to bring it. Okay, you're not on your own doing this. He's, he's going to partner with you. Um, so then you, we want you to bring your gift wrapped and unmarked. So it's not to anyone. It's not from anyone. Okay, just unmarked, just wrapped and unmarked. And we'll probably place them, you know, up here at the front on that Sunday. And then at the end of the service, the gifts will be um, distributed as the Lord sees fit. And we just believe that he will place them in the hands of the people who need them. And this will be um, not just a really cool kind of fun thing to do as a family, but it will be prophetic. It will be profound. And it will, it will be um, exactly what you need at the time you need it in the season you need it. And so we are just believing uh, for just a really cool experience, family time with this, and um, some testimonies of God's faithfulness in your giving and in your receiving. Amen? Amen. So if you have any questions about that, please let us know, and we'd be happy to answer them. This morning, I am um, talking about the gift exchange, and we are going to go on the topic of my shame for his shine. The exchange of the shame that we can feel in life and as things attach itself to us to the shine of God as he takes that shame from us. But let's start in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus took place under these circumstances. When his mother Mary had been promised in marriage to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. And her husband Joseph, being just and upright, not willing to expose her publicly and to shame or disgrace her, decided to dismiss her quietly and secretly. But as he was thinking it over, an angel of the Lord came to him and appeared in a dream saying, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people. All this took place that could be fulfilled, which the Lord had spoken through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took her as his wife. But he had no union with her until she bore her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Then if we go in, in Luke chapter 1, starting verse 26, we see uh, kind of how Mary responded to this news. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth. To a girl, never have been married, and a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph. 
And he came and he said, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled and disturbed and confused of what he was saying. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found grace with God. And listen, you will become pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. He will be great. And he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord will give him the throne of his forefather, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages. And there will be no end to this reign. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I have had no intimacy with a man as a husband? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the holy offspring, which shall be born of you, will be called the Son of God. The day Mary gave birth was a little much. (laughs) The day she found out she was going to give birth nine months later was maybe even a little more. See, there is, as we know, a preformed way to have babies. To start the process of one. We are aware of this. And given the fact that this had not yet happened in Mary's life, this was a dilemma. Now, I have literally heard everything in youth and young adult ministry. I have literally heard everything. Um, There's been times when a student or a young young adult would come to me and say, I want to share something with you. I'm going through something, and I really need freedom, and I would like to share that with you, but I'm not sure, and there would be, you know, some feeling, some hesitancy, because they were afraid of what they would have to say. And, And so many times in my life, I've looked them, and with a lot of care and concern, with but also with a little bit of candidness, I've literally heard everything. (laughs) There is nothing that you're going to say that is going to shock me, confuse me, scare me. Uh, I actually remember the day I heard it all. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, I do. I remember the day I heard it all. I was at a youth camp, and uh, we were ministering. It was a northern part of Canada. And um, before, after, and during some services, we were doing a lot of deliverance ministry on these students. There was just a lot happening in that region. And um, so students would um, manifest in the middle of service, and we would pull them out of the service and uh, bring healing to them. And it was awesome and crazy. And I remember the moment I heard it all when a young man was about to share some of the things that had strongholds in his life and he shared it and I literally sat there and I thought I have heard it all for real and so this is 19 years ago 19 years later I have not heard one thing that that had such a profound uh impact on me than in that moment so I've heard it all however sometimes you you hear it all in the sense of, this is deep, this is huge, this is a big thing. And sometimes you hear it all in the sense like, seriously, come on. That is just not true, you know, like that. And, and so sometimes I've, I've heard it, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Pastor Renee, we, you know, I found out that I'm pregnant, but I, I, like, I don't know how it happened. really. That happened once too. But this was not the case for Mary, for real with her. (laughs) She's like, I don't know how it happened. (laughs) She was the product of this immaculate conception type of situation. And, uh, which is quite a thing. She wasn't making this up. She, She, However, it was a problem because as awkward as if that actually did happen in today's day and age, back then, ah, gosh, that was the worst. You know, the, the cultural impact that that would have would have been very difficult to navigate. It was unheard of. The pressure that she would have felt would have been so intense Um the, the shame that would have been imposed on Mary uh, because of this would have been so drastic. And, and Mary actually left. She found out this news, and then she 
she ran away for three months. She just bailed. And uh, I wonder why. Like, sometimes I wonder, why did she do that? Was she scared? Was she just like, I don't know what to do right now, so I'm just going to go? Was she just like, I just need a minute (laughs) to figure this out, you know? I don't know. Was she worried about Joseph, what he would think? What what would he think I have done? You know, how would I convince him that this actually, you know, is the way it is? Or was she running to find a safe place? Because we all know if we read the story that she ran to her, her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with a miracle baby as well. See, as we, as we walk through, through life, things are going to happen to us and things are going to happen through us. And sometimes these things are hidden traps of the enemy and, or products of choices we've made. But sometimes it's the direction of the Spirit. And not everyone's going to understand. So you and I need safe place people. And I believe this is what Elizabeth was in her life. So she, she took off for those three months. Mary's situation could have brought a lot of shame on her. And I believe in a lot of ways it probably did. There are so many blanks that are left to be filled in that we don't know of right now. Through her own feelings even, her own insecurities, through others. But God knew that if Mary could, and she could, take on this call, this mission to carry the Messiah, to birth the Savior, and to bear all the extras that would have to come on her because of that, that she would shine. That she would overcome much, and through this, she would be an inspiration in her generation and forever, for the rest of the world and to the end of the world. Mary, fighting shame, I believe, at the start, with the shining glory of the king about to embark on her life. And then there's Joseph. Joseph wasn't without a struggle. Chasing him was, was the shame of choosing a girl who, um, you know, was careless and promiscuous. I'm sure that was some of the talk. Had he chosen the wrong one? Does love even matter at this point? What, what was he going to do with the people? His family is like, really? This is the one you chose? Mary herself, you know, Mary, how, how could you put this shame on me? Maybe he was ashamed of her for a brief moment. Had he not had this dramatic encounter with a supernatural being, I don't know if he would have been able to handle the news very well. But he did, and, and he, 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 he got this, this news. But even the news with an angel, he still planned on leaving her. He still was going to, but he was just going to do it in the right way. I'm just not going to expose her. I'm not going to do it public. I'm just going to do it like really nicely. Why? I think about that and I thought, well, if he really believed the angel that it had, there's nothing that Mary did wrong and this was a good thing, why would he still want to leave her? So he wouldn't have to deal. See, it's easier to walk away than it is to engage. It's simpler just to ignore something than to face it. That's why the masses quit and the few contend. It's also easier to talk of good intentions than to actually walk them out. See, maybe more of us need our voices to be silenced for a few days like Joseph. Just to stop us before we make all these promises that we never intend on fulfilling. I don't know why exactly Joseph's voice was taken away. Maybe that was it for him. Maybe he was like a no filter type of guy. Maybe he was just going to like all over everything and then regret it all later. I don't know. But all I know is that he had this time where he couldn't talk and all he could was process internally and with God. Joseph, shame, I believe, just crouching at the door of his life, the temptation to quit, but proves in the end it says he was esteemed. So much grace and trust he afforded Mary and God in the middle of the unknown. The agreement to take on this mandate with Mary, to, to be her support system, to stepfather Jesus. He was about to shine. 
See, this is the exchange. Jesus can take the shame, the people impose shame, the, the things that we feel about ourselves, the things that attach itself to us, and he, can, and he can switch it. He can exchange it for the shine and the glory of God on our lives. He can provide access, a way, a person, a process to replace it because we were meant to shine. See, the day that Jesus was, was born, Mary and Joseph had traveled. They'd been traveling for days. And they'd been knocking on doors in this one late evening because it was time for this baby to be born. It's late. They're exhausted. Mary is bigger probably than the average bear, yet she's riding a camel. So that's interesting. The contractions, no doubt, have started. She doesn't have any access to laughing gas or anything like that so probably it's not very funny at this point they're knocking on doors they're coming up empty nothing's happening and finally they land in the stable they're like this works you know it is what it is not everything looks how it should not everything is how it looks (laughs) but this was a messy process full of unknowns and continual change but the glory of the lord was about to be revealed And this is where we need to camp. See, your pain, my shame, my failure, my past mistakes, your past mistakes, your current situation doesn't define your life. The glory of the Lord is about to be revealed if we will let it. And maybe you're like, but but Renee, I am one of those, once you hear my story, you have heard it all, people. Maybe you feel like that because you've done so much or you've failed so much or your life is shame or you feel like you can't get out of your own way. As Mary dealt with, I believe, the shame that attempted to attach itself, although she had done nothing wrong, as Joseph battled through his in order to step in courage, into this journey that he didn't see coming, he didn't ask for. They both experienced transformation. And they were both products of this exchange. They they chose to accept the will of the Father and the plan of the Father instead of let the people's opinions and thoughts and culture attach itself to them. See, it doesn't matter the background of the shame. What matters is the foreground of the shine. It doesn't matter why you are where you are or why you feel what you feel, whether it's a supernatural direction of the Lord that other people don't get, whether it's a mistake that you keep making over and over and over and over. What matters is the direction you're going. There's a difference between guilt and shame, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but guilt is the feeling we have when we know we've done something wrong. Shame is when we feel wrong. Guilt is action. Shame is identity. Shame is who I am. Guilt, what I've done. So when you feel shame for something, you literally feel like it's a part of you. And that's why I've, I've experienced and I've known people that have had shame attached itself so profoundly to them that they can't walk into a room without sunglasses on because they can't bear to look people in the eye because they just feel if they see my eyes, they're going to know everything. People don't know, but they feel like they will because they feel like it's who they are. But when we encounter the one who can reveal truly who we are, that we are not based on what we've done, then that's when true transformation can take place. And that's when we can begin to shine. And that's when that shame that's attached itself to you can be removed from you. See, shame hides in shadows, but his shine demands its retreat. Because the darkness has to go. Now I'm feeling in this moment right now that Holy Spirit's doing some things in this room. And I can I can see on some of you you're feeling, you're sensing. And I just want to encourage you as I continue, 
Would you just allow Holy Spirit to come and to settle and to move? You are meant to shine. It's in your DNA. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what lies have been told to you about who you are. What matters is the truth of the glory of the Lord that's about to be revealed on you. See, your process may not look today the way you hoped it would. But he's with you. And he will get you there. Where? Where you're going. He's going to get you there. In your freedom, the light shines so bright, your past mistakes can't be seen. You can't see past the light. See, the light of the glory of God is blinding. The light blinds us to that fake news that the enemy has been trying to lie to you about. He's been trying to get you to believe. And the light of the glory of God blinds everything else around you. All we will see is the truth revealed. See, when the outside of your house, picture this, is decorated for Christmas, and you pull up at night and the lights are all on and it's dark, all you can see is the light. You can't see the imperfections of the house. You can't see the lawn. You can't see trash that could be on the ground. You can't see the paint that needs to be touched up. You can't see any of that. All you can see is the light because the light blinds us to all the imperfections and the mistakes around it. They don't matter at that moment. They fail to be the focus because the light shines bright. The night Jesus was born in that old smelly stable, I'm sure there was a lot of things that weren't right about it. A lot of things that didn't look great about it. Not much to look at. But with the illumination, the angels, the light, the glory of God shining on that place in that moment, that's all you could see. The imperfections cease to exist and cease to matter. Because in the end, it will all be for the glory of God. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 7, it says this. It says, instead of your shame, you will have double honor. And instead of humiliation, they will rejoice over their portion. Therefore, in the land they shall possess a double portion, and everlasting joy shall be theirs. Shame for double honor. You get to exchange your shame for double honor. See, he redeems us where we are, and he shares his very own glory with us, his shine on our lives. Isaiah chapter 62, starting in verse 3 to 5, it says, you'll get a brand new name straight from the mouth of God. You'll be a stunning crown in the palm of God's hand, a jeweled gold cup held high in the hand of your God. No more will anyone call you rejected. And your country will be no more called Rune. You will be called Hapzibah, which means my delight. And your land, Beulah, which means married. Because God delights in you. And your land will be like a wedding celebration. See, this is who we are. We're not too lost. We're not too trapped. We're not too gripped by the hand of the enemy. You may feel different or outcast or, or, or misfits. We use that word where, where people will just feel, I'm just so different because I've done these things and I don't fit the mold or what should be in the church or what should be used of the Lord because I've done this and I have this and I'm still walking through this. You are not too misfit. You are not too outcast within your context of this family, of your family, of this culture. Because you have placement where God has put you. And you belong where he has released you. In fact, I would not only say that you belong and that you are part, but I would say that it is imperative that you stay. Because God places people in positions and in families. 
He places, it says in the Bible, the lonely within families. It is imperative that we walk out our call and, our, and the plan of God where we are and the process of what we are walking through where we are. Because it is more likely that you in your brokenness and your pain and your imperfections are likely the one to impose change and transformation here. into situations that maybe otherwise would stay the same. See, God chooses you, and he chooses me, and he places me, and he places you, and then he says, follow me. Follow me. Lay it all down. And our response is to say to the king, yes, I will. I will Submit myself to the process of change. I will submit myself to the exchange that you have for me because I don't want to live there anymore. I want the glory of the Lord to be revealed in my life. And I know there are people in this room that you're like, that's me. I just want it all. I just give my life for Jesus. And I don't feel worthy and I don't feel worth it sometimes. But it is what I want. And I am trying. And I know you're, I know you're here. And the people who say yes to this train in the secret place. And I believe that there is a core within this family that are being trained in the secret place even right now. And I believe there is a call to holiness within this family of people who are being trained in the secret place. And in there has been seasons of the past where that has not been the case necessarily. And I feel like there has been some shame that's tried to attach itself because of that. But the glory of the Lord is about to be revealed. Because there is a call. And there is a people that are saying yes to this call. It's a stand against compromise. It's a stand for holiness. And it's multi-generational. This will launch us out of hiding. I believe that the Lord has kept us hidden as we walk through change and grace and process. And now... As these people, and you are, you, are, you are these people, receive the call to holiness, to no compromise, to say yes, to lay down lover, there is a launch coming for you and for this family out of your shame into his shine, out of the shadows, come on, into the limelight. You may be young, inexperienced. You may be older or non-assuming. You may be complicated, different. You may be feel, well, I'm the same as everybody else. But I feel like there's an assignment of heaven on your life and on my life right now. In this moment of time. And it's something new and it's something fresh. And it's something so current that we need to say yes in this moment. Because there is a a, a, a new sound, there is a new voice, there is a new word of the Lord yet to be heard from this family. Our best days are ahead of us. Our best days are ahead of us. They're here and they're coming. So it is time, it is time in your own life and in the life of this family to forget the former things, to forget the past, to stop talking about it. It doesn't matter anymore. What matters is what is ahead and what God's saying right now in our season and what's coming. Because the Father is removing shame from this church, I believe, from your life, from individuals and, and this family who have, we have been ripped off by it for so long and he's b about to restore a place of double honor. Yeah. 
In 1 Samuel 2, verse 8, it says, He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and to make them inherit the glory, the throne of glory. See, if we don't say yes, though, if we don't allow the exchange, if we don't embark and participate on it, we will never reach the potential. We'll just keep going around that same mountain. Guys, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to just keep circling the same mountain over and over in your lives in this church. We want to reach the place where God has destined us to go. We want to, to be called and then to be sent. It's not enough just, oh, I know I'm called. I'm called of the Lord. This is great. If you never are sent, then what's the point? You're just potential. That's it. Potential is good, but on tapped, it means nothing. Your agreement is the unlocking agent, and your part matters. Your choice without the angel, without Mary, a teenage girl, without the angel telling Mary, she wouldn't have known the mystery of the plan of God within her. Without the shepherds who came that day, King Jesus wouldn't have had his first visitors who shared the wonders of what he would be. Without the stable being willing, the stable owner being willing to just take people in at a late night, a couple of tourists who were having a baby, the king of the world would have had no place to enter. Without Joseph and his loyalty and his trust, Mary wouldn't have been cared for. She wouldn't have been protected. Without Mary, who said yes to the plan of God, there would have been no original carrier of the presence of God. One of the greatest examples of a laid-down lover. Without the shine of the star, the wise men couldn't find the king to give the gifts to. Without the wise men and their commitment to God and to King Jesus, Jesus would have been found and killed by King Herod. Without Jesus coming in the worst of ways, but yet king of the world, living perfect, dying perfect, we'd be stuck in our shame, we'd be stuck in our past, and we would never live out our future. Without you, without me, without your friends, without family, parents, without the children, the co-workers, or the grandparents who have prayed for you or prayed for me, we would never know freedom, and they would never know freedom. See, we all have a part to play, and our yes matters in that part. We need to live our placement well. But it starts by getting free. And that's the beginning. It starts by trusting Jesus more than you trust yourself. I always say to people, do you have someone in your life that you trust more than you trust yourself? Because if you don't, you need to find someone. Because our feelings will lie to us. The, the enemy will trick us. He'll set traps for us. And when we don't know where to turn, we need to know that we have one person at least that we can go to and say, what am I feeling here? Am I on track? What's, and we, when, whatever they say, we need to trust them more than we can trust us in our, in our feelings in that moment. We need to start by getting free. See, someone else's freedom always hangs on mine because we are connected. And to neglect yourself is to cause strain on another. The Bible talks about how we are one body and every part contributes to the whole. And if there is an ailment in one part of the body, another part will have to pick up the slack. We are all one body, so doing our part matters. Don't risk someone else never being offered change because you didn't think your freedom mattered. The smallest ripple effect impacts beyond our capacity to fully understand it. Smith Wigglesworth, if you know him, profound healing evangelist, his grandma brought him to church as a young boy. D.L. Moody was introduced by Jesus by his Sunday school teacher. 
he went on to lead one million people to the Lord. Billy Graham, the greatest evangelist of our time, came to the Lord at a Mordecai Ham crusade. Mordecai Ham couldn't even date his conser- conversion. He didn't know when he got saved, when he became a Christian. He attributed his spiritual inclinations and his desire to follow Jesus to the devotional habits in his home growing up. He said, from the time I was eight years old, I just never thought of myself as anything but a Christian. It's a family Christian environment. The impact of a fully committed life to Christ cannot be measured. But it begins with a fully aware identity and a completely healed heart. There is no room for shame in your life. There is no room. This morning, I believe Jesus is here to do this exchange for you. And I believe it's so important. And I don't know if you came expecting to hear a message like this this morning. It's just like a little heavy. But it's time to have those things lifted off your life. Your shame for his shine. See, what you thought would destroy you, I believe, will instead launch you. Double honor back on your life. You've been held back long enough. You've been held on to long enough by the wrong thing. You don't have to go another day dragging this trash behind you. I've been there. I've carried shame. I've been tormented. Even... I'll tell you this in a minute. But I've been tormented by lies of the enemy trying to trick me into believing something about myself that wasn't true. I've carried it. I've cried it out. I've danced over it (laughs) while I'm crying. I've wrestled it out. I've laid on the floor. And I've found freedom in all of that through all of that. But I believe that there are people here, some of you here today, maybe all of you, maybe two of you, I don't know, but I believe it's significant because for a lot of reasons. But last night I was telling Craig, he was asking me when we got up, like, how do you sleep? And he's been fighting something and coughing a little bit, so he was wondering if he kept me awake. I said, no, uh, I didn't hear you coughing. It was fine, but I had a weird night. And he said, oh, what do you mean by weird? And I said, I was literally tormented all night. And this is what happened. I was dreaming. And in my dreams, I was trying to get to my message. And yeah, I wanted to go over it. I wanted to study it. I wanted to just soak in it a little bit before this morning. This is in my dreams, though. This is, this is not like, I'm not awake. I'm dreaming about this. So in my dream, I'm going to find my Bible. I'm going to find my message. And every time I went to go get it, something would come against me. And every time it was a different situation, but it was shame-related. It, w- it was um, an example of shame that could be in someone's life. And that person or situation would come against me and it would like take me out. And I couldn't get to my message. And then I would wake up as soon as that happened. And then I'd go back to sleep. And I would go, oh, I need to go, I need to send my message for tomorrow morning. And I would go looking for it again. And then someone can, I'm not going to go through all the different scenarios, but there were five or six, I believe, different scenarios that came against me all shame imposed and would try to do something and every time didn't let me get to my message. And one time, actually, I had your Bible in my hand and this, um, I got carried out into the ocean, actually, with your Bible in my hand and um, dropped and the Bible went under the water. And I was trying to get it. And I believe the enemy was just taunting through the night because I believe there's so much attached to your freedom this morning if you will participate in this exchange that the Lord has for you I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now
this is a difficult thing to respond to because shame of itself when you feel it you just want to go into hiding and you don't necessarily want to be you know exposed for all to to, to watch so i'm going to ask for any of our ministry team just to kind of be off to the side over here and over here um and as we wind down if you feel like you need personal ministry, I would like you to find someone and go and receive that personal ministry to you. But also, you could just turn to the person next to you and ask them for prayer. You don't have to come. We're a family here. And if there's someone that you trust, if you have a safe place person, if you have an Elizabeth in this room where you can be like, I can just go and I can share my heart and they can help pray for me, then I would like for you to do this. I want to encourage you, though, whether it's in this moment or whether it's when you leave and you call up that friend, I want to encourage you to find your healing and find your freedom. Your shame for his shine. The glory of the Lord is about to be revealed. You have so much hinging on your freedom, and not just for you, but for the world. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your, your, your kids that are here today. And I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. God, I pray that today, as you're speaking to each of us, even right now, Holy Spirit, as you're releasing just your goodness and your love and your safety, I, I just pray that the arms of the Father would be felt around each of us right now. That we would know that we are not out on our own. We are not alone in this. We all go through things. We all have things that attach itself to us. We are not a product of that. We are not uh, defined by that, but we are defined by the truth of the glory of the Lord that is about to be revealed on our lives. So I pray for each one that there would be a lifting of our heads. There would be a removing of the sunglasses, so to speak, so that they could be seen and heard and released into all that you have for their lives. I pray for safe place people. I pray right now for someone in this room that says, I don't know of anyone that I could trust or anyone I go, could go to. I pray right now that you would drop the name of that person, that trusting person that they could go to and find their freedom with a family member. God, would you bless them? Would you pour out your spirit and your love and your goodness? And would you release us into all that you have in your name?